Having considered permutations where the order matters, i.e. AB is not the same as BA, we can think instead of combinations. And we'll do this with a very practical example and a very Australian example here. And we'll do this based on Melbourne's grid system. If we look at this map, I've marked two points. Um, one's marked as Flinders Street Station and the other is Etihad Stadium. Um, this screen cap's a little bit out of date. I think it's now Marvel Stadium. But anyway, the big stadium in Docklands in Melbourne. When I've got this, the entrance to Etihad Stadium is six blocks west and two blocks north of Flinders Street Station. So if we wish to never go backwards, so we know we need to go north and we need to go west, let's assume that the only times that we walk a block is either walking one block west or walking one block north. So there's no reason ever to go backwards, walk east, so further away, or south, further away. How many different ways could I get from Flinders Street Station to the entrance to Etihad Stadium. It's not instantly obvious at this point how the counting arguments that we've seen so far with ideas like permutations and permutations with repetition relate to this problem. But we can think of it this way. To get from Flinders Street Station to the entrance of Etihad Stadium, you need to walk for eight blocks. And doesn't matter where the northern ones kick in, but you need to do six blocks walking west and two blocks walking north. So this is just the same as finding the number of arrangements of going west, 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 north, north. But how many times I can arrange that? Maybe the first two things I do are walk two blocks north, then six blocks west. Or maybe I go six block west, two blocks north. Or maybe I go three west, one north, three west, one north. If I figure this out, there is obviously eight factorial ways I can arrange those eight letters relating to the eight directions. But in fact, west appears six times replicated, the north appears two-fold duplicated. So the combinations of this is basically a permutations with repetition problem. But I start by thinking I've got eight factorial orderings, but I reduce that by a factor of six factorial to acknowledge that uh, west appears replicated six times, and I reduce that by a factor of two factorial to acknowledge that north appears duplicated twice. So eight factorial divided by six factorial, two factorial is 28. And nicely, of course, what I do always have this property that the two numbers within the factorials on the bottom should sum to the number on the top. Because this is just the same as picking which of the two eight positions the northern, um, the northern moves are done. And this is a selection problem that if I've got K elements to select from N elements, then I've got, there's various bits of notation here, that I've got N choose K combinations. So I can write this as N C K. You will often see that notation perhaps on like a calculator button. You'll sometimes see it looking a bit like a tower vector, a bit like a 
um, one column two row vector with the n above the k. And both of those bits of notation are equal to n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. So what this also shows as well is that picking two elements from a list of eight is the same as picking six elements from a list of eight because where I place the six west or where I place the two north, once I've done that, that locks in the other bit. And you can see that as well from the combination formula there. But in fact, if I replace k with n minus k, then I replace n minus k with n minus n minus k, which is k, so I'll get the same thing. So the problem of picking seven elements from a set of 100 is the same as the problem of picking 93 elements from a set of 100. So this n choose k, you'll see those two notations, the n, c, k, and the like tower vector-like format. You might also, if you use something like Microsoft Excel, that just equals combin, well, for the number of combinations. So I'd put in equals combin, in this case, eight and two, and it would give me eight choose two is uh, 28, as we saw on the previous slide. Now these are related to the binomial theorem. Maybe you've done a bit of probability theory, maybe you haven't, but if I think of flipping a coin, and I'm not going to assume now that the coin is fair, it might be biased. But let's say when I flip it each time, it has probability P of landing heads, and therefore probability one minus P of landing tails on each flip. So what's the chance that I get three heads on 10 flips? Well, the chance that I get, for example, heads, 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 then seven tails, that's not the same as the chance of getting three heads on 10 flips. That's the same as the chance of getting three heads on three flips, then zero on seven. But if I work this out, the chance that I get heads is P, multiplied by the chance that I get heads is P, multiplied by the chance that I get heads is P, multiplied by one minus P, one minus P, and so on seven times over. So that probability in order of getting three heads and then seven tails would give me P to the power of three multiplied by one minus P to the power of seven. But the original question was what's the chance of getting three heads in the 10 flips, not getting three heads as the first three results followed by zero in the last seven. So I need to account for how many ways three heads and seven tails could be arranged in an outcome in a string of 10 outcomes. Now we've already seen how to do this. This is just a permutation problem with repetition. So we can consider this as the combination formula. So 10 choose three. And 10 choose 3 is 10 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 7 factorial. Again, noting that the two numbers within the factorial, 3 and 7, add up to the other number in the factorial, 10. So 10 factorial divided by 3 factorial, 7 factorial, means there's 120 ways that I could get 3 heads and 7 tails in a string of 10 ordered outcomes. So the chance of getting exactly three heads in 10 flips is 10 choose three, or 120, times p cubed, times one minus p to the power seven. And in general, if I've got k heads from n flips, then I would say I've got n choose k, times the chance of getting k heads in some order would be p to the k times the chance of getting n minus k tails in some ordering would be one minus p to the n minus k. It also gives us a nice 
side result of this. Now, the chance that I get some number of heads when flipping n coins is 1. It must have probability 1. If I add up the chance of getting 0, plus the chance of getting 1, plus the chance of getting 2, all the way the chance of getting n, which is the maximum, those numbers must add up to 1. I'm 100% certain that when I flip the coin a given number of times, I will get a number of heads. Could be zero, but I will get some number. So what this does tell me is that because P plus one minus P is equal to one, then one is equal to P plus one minus P to the power of N, one to the N is one, and that would be equal to adding up all of these probabilities. So if I add up N choose K, times p to the k times 1 minus p to the n minus k over all possible values of k being the being from 0 to n that total has to be 1 and this leads to the binomial theorem and this tells us that when we multiply out um, expanding brackets a plus b to the power n then what I will get to is I will get to this is the sum of n choose k times a to the k, b to the n minus k, summed over all k being between 0 and n. So, for example, a plus b all cubed would give me a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. And that is because... That 1, 3, 3, 1 that I just said was because 3 plus 3 choose 0 is 1, 3 choose 1 is 3, 3 choose 2 is 3, and 3 choose 3 is 1. And this leads to this, if I write out the binomial coefficients, you may have seen this on the wall of maybe a high school maths class, if I look across each row, I've got 1, then 1, 1, then 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, and so on. And that's because the reason there's 1s outside the edge is any number choose 0, there is one way of doing it. Any number choose itself, there's one way of doing it. So that's why I've got the 1s at the outside. And then we can see it gets a bit more complicated, but you can see the ones inside. Any number choose one is just the number itself. And this is so-called a Pascal triangle. And you can actually see that um, every element in that list, in that triangle, is equal to the sum of the two numbers just above it. One diagonally above it to the left and one diagonally above it just to the right. And this is named Pascal Triangle. You've probably seen these before. Um, and what we've got is that the kth entry on the nth row is just n minus 1 choose k minus 1. And we can thank the beautiful flowing locks of Blaise Pascal.